So, good morning everyone. Um, I'm uh, Mathieu Bourget. Um, today I will present you an introduction to uh, uh, what we used to do um, uh, data analysis of um, uh, NGS data. So, what tool we use, what type of uh, sorry, what type of uh, 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 computing stru stru structure we use and the, and the data. So I will be pre do the presentation for this uh, module and uh, the lab for this uh, uh, for this uh, module and the lab for the next uh, module, uh, the module three. So you will see that the lab, the two labs are really uh, connected. Um, so today, the, object the learning objective of this module is to introduce you the uh, computing uh, resources that you can use to do uh, NGS analysis uh, to understand the type of data and what we do with the data, uh, to know to learn about the terminology and the format of the file we will need, and to do that while uh, looking at how we analyze uh, the NSEC uh, um, uh, data. So first, I will uh, present you the how we use uh, HPC server. So HPC stands for High Performance Computing Server. So uh, we are using HPC server because when uh, we analyze NGS data, uh, due to the size of the data and to the volume of the data we generate for the, for the kind of project uh, we are working on, the traditional computer you can use uh, is not, uh, has not enough power to do your analysis. So if you run it on your own computer, it will take uh, months or years just to, to run your, your analysis. So what we need is to have a really uh, high uh, level of uh, uh, computing resource to do your analysis. So it's why in Canada we have the chance to have Compute Canada that provides this uh, HPC uh, center. So what are HPC uh, center? It's uh, a set of cluster. What are the cluster? It's a like a grouping of uh, hundred or thousand of individual computer in the same place. So not really an individual computer, but just the um, computing resource of like an individual computer. So each computer is called a node, and in each node we have a processor, which are called a CPU. So in Canada, we are lucky. We have Compute Canada. So it's a, a platform, a national platform, uh, which uh, try to merge all the consortium for the different uh, province, uh, which provide the uh, HPC resources. So depending on which province you are coming from, you uh, will go to usually one of the other uh, consortia. Uh, so if you want to use Compute Canada to do your analysis, uh, uh, and uh, you need to, to, to have a um, Compute Canada account. Uh, and uh, why uh, you need to, have a, to, to go to have this account is because uh, the idea of behind Compute Canada is instead of the government, instead of financing uh, directly researchers to build their own small cluster, they prefer to give the money to uh, one group, so Compute Canada, and to reduce all the management of this, uh, of this cluster. So if you want to use their resource, you will need to uh, go and be part of the consortium to have your account. And when you have your account, it will. Uh, when you have your account, you will have free uh, resource. So free resource need you will have a storage space, so a place where you can put your data. So it's a, it's a lim limited space, but you will uh, you could ask for extension every year if you uh, the size of your data, or the quantity of data you have grows, and you will have a compute time allocation. So what you mean by compute time allocation? It means that you will have um, a number of uh, curly year use uh, time. So that uh, a bit complicated to understand, but the, the idea behind you is it gives you a set of time where you can use the computer with high pr priority. And once you have used all your, your allocation, you can still use uh, their, um, uh, their resources, but you will, be, uh, you will have lower uh, priority compared to people that didn't have uh, used all their allocation. So just to have a fair use of everybody that is part of the of the of the consortium. So when you are logged on your um, on Compute Canada servers, and what you do, you just uh, launch your. What you want to do is to launch your job, and when this job are, are execute, then it will use your allo your allocation. So how you get your account? You just need to go to uh, Compute Canada. Uh, then 
Uh, what you need is when you have your account in Topicana, you need to ask an account on the uh, local provincial consortium you want to, to be part of. And in this consortium, you will choose which HPC server you need uh, you want to be uh, to be running your uh, your analysis. When you have your um, set up everything and you could access to your um, server, uh, you will go to the to the server and you will log and you will arrive on a login node. So there's two types of node. There's login node, working node. So login node is when you arrive on the on the on the server, and it's uh, just an entry point for everybody. And the role of this uh, when you of this um, of this uh, node is just to allow you to submit your job to a scheduler. So a scheduler is a software that takes your jobs, find uh, the available resources on the graph of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the cluster, and match what you ask to what is, what is available to, uh, ma to make your job going through the good um, uh, um, computing resource that match your, uh, what, you, what is required for your, for your job. So uh, when you go there, uh, be careful, don't. Uh, some people, some new users try to launch their job directly on login nodes, which is really bad because it's a really a limited resources that is shared for, for, every, for everybody. So if you run your job there, then your sysadmin will try to be on your back and say, stop doing that, you block everybody. So it's a kind of a, a general rule. In the case of the lab practical today, so we will work on one HPC server uh, in Quebec, which is called Mammoth. Uh, but we won't be on a login node. It's directly set up that you will arrive and everybody will be on one big uh, uh, working node. So we will directly launch for job, which is so not exactly the way you will do it if you will be on the on a real HPC um, server. So um, as we will don't see that during the, pra the practical, uh, when you launch your jobs, uh, as I say, you will. You will uh, specify your uh, the task you want to do to the scheduler, and the scheduler will uh, match your task to um, the computing resources. So you will have a time where you will wait that the scheduler is able to find the good uh, resources for your jobs, which is the que queuing time. And this time will depend really on how what you set as uh, is needed for your job. So it depends on the number of uh, of uh, CPU, the, the length of your jobs, and how uh, how loaded is the cluster. So you can try to play with this parameter to reduce uh, the, the job length, the queue length, sorry. Because sometimes if you have really short jobs, you can spend more time in queue than really running your, uh, your job. So it's kind of a, a game to find the best, the, the most optimal way to, to submit your job. So that's a good thing. You have these uh, resources uh, where you can uh, launch your job. But what you can do uh, with this um, with these um, uh, resources. Uh, if you don't have any um, um, tools or um, resources you, ca you can use to, to do your analysis. So uh, C3G, in, partner in partnership with uh, Compute Canada, uh, we are uh, working on a system which is called CVNFS, which uh, stands for uh, CERN uh, Virtual Machine File System, uh, which is the idea is to have one location where we maintain uh, all the tools and resources at one location, and it's uh, spread between the different, uh, not all, but a lot of cluster in Compute Canada, where you will have whatever the cluster you use, you will have access to the same tools that have been installed the same way and the same type of resource, I mean, the same type of uh, genome uh, reference sequence and everything. So the idea is to, re to reduce the management for, for users. So you don't need to install a genome, you don't need to install a tool, you just ask people and we will ask for you. Yes? Quick question. Is Compute Canada only available for people who are in Canada? Yes. Well, I, I will talk in, in, the, in, the, in the two slides about that. Okay. But uh, yes. So the question was is uh, uh, Compute Canada is, uh, available for, for Canadian only? Only. Okay. Yeah. Well, you can collaborate. So if you have a collaborator in Canada, okay. so the green account has to be like, PI in Canada. I see. But on um, projects. So as I say, in the CMFS, we have um, we maintain a set of uh, bioinformatics tools. Uh, so most of tools, uh, I think it's, now it's more than uh, 90. But every time somebody uh, asks us to install a new tool, we will, we will install. We will first test the tool, see if the tool is uh, interesting for the community, and if, if yes, we'll install the tool so all the community will have access to the tools. We also 
uh, providing uh, resources uh, in many so many builds and for many spaces, and we also provide a standards uh, standardized uh, pipeline to do uh, a classical type of uh, NGS analysis. So all these uh, all these resources are, are used through um, a set of module system. So the, you mean when you arrive to your uh, to the to the HPC server, you have nothing in your environment, but you have access through a module. Uh, a module available. You can have the list of all the resources that are available, and you can load the the tool you need to your environment. And this will only set up your environment to use this tool. So you can load three, four, five tools at the same time, whatever how many you want, and everything will be set up, and you will you will be able to uh, to uh, use this tool. So the question: What to do if you are not Canadian? So the first uh, <laughs> first choice is to can become Canadian. But no. More than yeah. <laughs> uh, so you have to know that most of what I present here is a really um, a common concepts that are shared by most of the uh, HPC server and most of the other uh, computing server like cloud and, um, and other type of instance. The only difference is if you use this other type of instance or this other type of uh, servers is that you won't have all the tools and pipelines that have been pre-installed for uh, for you with a uh, or partnership with Compute Canada, so you will probably have to uh, to analyze, to install the tools uh, on your own. But if you want to do that, you can go on your uh, on your PubHub website where we have a, a bunch of script for every tools we maintain. We 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 provide an install script for, so any any everyone wants to reinstall this tool somewhere somewhere else can just take a script and run it and it will go fetch a, fetch a source on the internet and and install the script uh, correctly okay so now we have seen uh, where we should do analysis now what we do with the data and what type of data we are what we are uh, talking about so we are talking about uh, next generation sequencing data so uh, these data are really um, um, evolution of uh, an old technology which was the called uh, clone based sequencing so in the older technology in, you have a clone you put your your genus fragment and your sequence and you you sequence around like uh, 196 uh, sequence at the time here the idea is to extend this uh, techniques to be able to sequence millions of fragments at the same time so how how it works uh, so you have this sequencer and the sequencer just instead of doing like a standard uh, sequencing where is is measuring the, how base is, is integrated is just take picture of each cycle and the picture uh, generate cluster of fluorescence which represent every base incorporation in each uh, fragment. So how it works? Uh, so there's many um, there's many uh, technology uh, to do the sequencing. Uh, I decide to focus only on the Illumina uh, technology because it's more used uh, actually and probably will stay the more used for the for the for a longer time. So the idea of the Illumina technology is to do a bridge amplification. So what you do, you have your DNA, uh, you have your DNA, you share your DNA to a given uh, fragment size, usually around four to five hundred uh, base pair. You add your adapters, and so you have this set of of a short fragment and you load your uh, so you have this specific adapter here at each end of the of the fragment and then you load a, a big set of um, uh, of a fragment on your flow cell so the flow cell is what you you will put in your in your sequencer and in the flow cell you will have amplification of your uh, of your sequence so the adapter you have you will put at the at each end of the fragment will match some uh, free probes that are put on the flow cells, so the molecule will uh, bind the probes, and they will be amplified to generate a two-strand molecule. So you will generate the complementary molecules, and then the two uh, two-strand structure will be break, and you will have a copy of your molecule, the reverse copy of your molecule that will be attached to the flow cells. So you will have other, uh, you will have then other. Um, probes that are uh, free. So your molecule with the, the probe at the other end will match free probes in the close proximity of the, of the one you, you, you have uh, generated. And you will have the bridge amplification, so the amplification of the, of the reverse of the first copy, so the copy of your, of your initial fragment. You will do amplification, and you will uh, break this two-strand structure, and you will 
have two copy in two directions, which are linked to your to your uh, flow cell. And what you will do, you will repeat this um, this process of, uh, multiple times, and you will end up in your flow cell with a cluster of molecules, which contain uh, two set of two uh, set of molecules. So the same molecules, but in, in the two direction. Then you will start to do uh, your amplification. So you will start with one adapter, so one of the two molecule direction. You will you will match your adapter, and then you will incorporate your, your, the amplification, the, um, the 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 corresponding bases uh, to your uh, to your to your molecules. While the bases you will incorporate contain um, a fluorescent. Um, fluorescence and at each, at each base incorporation you will take a picture of the flow cell and for each cluster you will see the same fluorescence that will, that will, that will flash and you will be able to uh, see the, the cluster as one dot on your flow cells like this one so if you go to so the first for, for example at the first one you will if I if we take this cluster we will see a, a yellow a yellow dot and a, a blue dot and a green dot yellow dot red dot and and it's how we are able for this molecule to understand what are the sequence because each color is uh, linked with one specific basis. So the, the trick is what doing the sequencer is takes is take this picture and then is able to uh, for each uh, cluster based on the position on the on the flow cell to regenerate the sequence of the, of your fragment. Yes. So each cluster is bidirectional, right? Yeah. Actually, it's, uh, so uh, I don't know if we see it here. So we will start with one. So when we do, so usually we do pairs and reads. So we have one read that starts with uh, adapters. So the, the sequencing will start only with the molecule in one direction at the beginning, because the, uh, there will be uh, adap adapters that is complementary. The adapters, the two ends are different. So the molecules that are in one direction, you add first specific adapter, so you will only go with in one direction. And then you will clean the all the molecules of your cluster. And then you read the other type of adapters that will read the sequence that are in the other direction. And then you will be able to not, do not uh, mix your uh, signal with the two uh, set of uh, molecules. Is that an error reduction technique? Sorry? Is that an error reduction technique? Bidirectional sequencing? Uh, no, it's just uh, so the question is: Is um, uh, uh, bidirectional sequencing is an uh, error reduction technique? No, it's just because um, the quality of the sequencing decreases with time. So you can go from one extremity to the other, ex uh, to the to from one end to the other end in one shot. Otherwise, the quality of the sequencing at the uh, at the end of the molecule will be uh, will be bad. And uh, also, the molecule will be too long, so we'll, so the the sequencer won't be able to sequence this uh, size of reads. So the idea is really to to re to sequence one extremity and the other extremity to have like the two copy of the of the like the two extremity of the of the of the DNF original DNF fragment to be able to locate the two fragments and to uh, try to find some specific variation. Due to this fragment, so it's it's more because we cannot go one uh, in one shot over all the um, all the all the fragment. First, because the size of the fragment is too long, and second, because the quality will will uh, drop down. So, other technique, if you if we think about like black bio or nanopore, all these kind of new techniques, which is longer reads, are more doing one molecules, but with longer reads and go straight, but it's a totally different way of doing sequencing. So if you are interested, we can discuss about that at the end of um, after the next break. So now, when we when you design your uh, NGS experiment, what you what type of parameter you need to take into account? Uh, mainly the read length, so the length of your reads. Uh, so it depends of your size of your size of the molecule of the size of molecule. The type of library. So will you do only one direction, two direction, depending on on your uh, on your type library. For example, if you use, if you are interested with uh, small RNA analysis, you don't need to do two, two direction because your molecule is only like uh, thirty base pair long. So you just need to go straight to one uh, molecule. What type of error you will face depending on the sequencing uh, technologies? 
PacBio is more, uh, Pac, uh, so, sorry, Lina is more like substitution. PacBio, for example, is more like uh, indels. So depending on what you're interested in, it's, uh, it's interesting to look at the different technology. Uh, also, how you can, how many reads you can generate, and can you put several samples in the same lane? Because usually, one lens couldn't be too much for your uh, experiment, so you, you want to, um, to reduce the cost by putting several um, uh, samples in the same lane. So the cost and the return, turnaround time is also some parameters, but it sh should not be the parameters that uh, lead your choice about how you design your experiment. Most of the time, when people come to see us and they have design their, their analysis based on cost and turnaround time, they don't have made the good choice of how to answer their bi biological question. So we have this NGS, and so we have this sequence. And what we want to do in the case as presented by uh, Mike in the previous lab, we want to uh, find uh, the variants that are related to some specific diseases uh, or some specific phenotypes. So the, what we want is to start from the sequence we have generated by the machine to, uh, to, so to, the, to, the, to the list of variants specific to, the, in, to uh, our uh, sample. So this is the pipeline we use to do that. And in, in this lab, we will focus on so this is a full, full pipeline to do that. So in this lab, we will focus on the first part of the pipeline. In uh, lab three, we'll focus on the second part. Uh, uh, but the idea of this really uh, lab two is to provide you um, the step to arrive to a, a file that is ready to do a variant uh, calling. So as we say here, we start from the FASTQ file, which I will explain, which is a, the format of file you will have from your sequencer, and you want to have to, a, to a, a file, so to data that are uh, ready to do variant calling. So what are the FASTQ file? So this is the files you will receive from your uh, center. It's a set of sequence that represents if you are a, a single one, uh, one uh, read of each uh, DNA molecule, or two read of each DNA molecule if you are paired. Uh, so these two sequences represent the two, one or two end of your, uh, of your original DNA molecule for each molecule. So if you, up, if you open these kind of uh, molecules, uh, the format will be like that. We'll have four lines for each, uh, for each uh, sequence. The first line will be uh, the either of your, mo of, your, uh, of, your of your sequence, which contains the name of the sequence. And in the name, you have the location on your flow cell. So the name is really based on the experiment and your machines and everything and the location of your of your sequence. And at the end here, you will have an indication if you are on read one on, or on read two. So all the read one will be together, all the read two will be together. The second line is really the sequence itself. The third line is a second possibility for an either. So most of Illumina um, format want you we want use we want this second either, but some other format could have the like kind of um, duplication of the first either here, and then you have a quality. So the quality is okay. I need to go fast. So the quality of your, of the of the sequence uh, is um, um, ASCII character. So ASCII can be translated to a numerical character. So a ASCII character that uh, tells the quality of your of your data. So what is the quality? The quality is a thread score. So when you convert your ASCII to a numerical value. You obtain this, what you call the best quality, and this best, best quality stands for minus 10 log bas 10 of a probability, and the probability is a probability that the base you have sequence is not the good one. So if we talk about a best quality of 20, we have 1% chance that the base that we are looking at is wrong. So what we do with the data, usually, we have this, this fast queue. What we do, usually, we QC this fast queue. So what we do, we look at the base quality for each cycle for all the sequences, and, we'll, when, and we're sure that the quality is, uh, is enough. So more than usually 20 or 30 uh, in, in general. If you have low quality, uh, usually it could affect your analysis afterwards. What we do also, we usually look at the, sequence, the base content. Quick, just, yeah? Simple question about the whisker plot and the frequency. Sorry? The whisk, just the spots and whisker plot. Mm -hmm. um, the, the little, the little red line that's in the middle represents the median. What yep. is the, the line that's at the bottom of the second part 
I think you have the mean and the median. Expected that it starts dropping off as you get more and more cycles. Yeah, yeah, it's because your your cluster, when you incorporate the, the basis, all the sequence of your cluster, they don't have the same rate of incorporation. Mm -hmm. So you will have some some molecules that will be in advance, some molecules that will be delayed, that will uh, play on the quality of your uh, of your cluster. So the type of so QC we do, we look the base content. We'll look also if we find the adapter. So if your molecules are short, you will find the, the, the sequence, the non-genomic sequence that you have at end at, find at the, uh, the end of your molecules. We also look the duplication rates. So how many time a molecule, if we have some molecule that has been uh, uh, artificially um, duplicated. We also do kind of this kind of QC where we take random reads and just at last a set of random room for your fast queue to the to the NL databases to just ensure that what you have sequenced correspond to what you expect in terms of spacing of uh, so if you sequence human and you have this result of mouse you say oh I got a problem with my sequence so when we have done generate this matrix and we are okay with the quality uh, what we do we usually do trimming if the quality is not is not good is not good enough so uh, what the what the the goal of doing trimming is to remove the possible adapter that could be at your end of your uh, each extremity. So when you sequence a read, if the read is too short, you will have the adapter at the end. So you want to remove this adapter because it's not part of your genomic data. You want also to remove uh, the base that are under uh, a level of base quality because you don't want to, uh, to, in to introduce error in your data. Uh, so when we do that, after, after a little, so uh, cleaning the sequence, so removing some bases. If the reads are too short, we discard the reads because if the reads are too short, the mapping will be uh, will be a crap. So we don't want really short reads, so we keep only a uh, larger read. So to do that, we do we use Trimomatic, but there's many of tools you can use. So after doing uh, trimming, we do alignment. So alignment is what you do with your read in, when they are they are clean. So you, you have two choices. Either you have a reference sequence. Usually, you do alignment. So the, the idea of the alignment is to find the best location of your reads onto your reference sequence. If you don't, if you don't have any reference sequence, you do. You generally do assembly, where you build this consensus reference sequence, and then you do your alignment of on your um, consensus sequence. So when we do read mapping, it's a bit challenging because you need to locate a million of short fragments in a really large. Uh, space of possibilities because the size of your genomes and it's challenging first because uh, you will have many reads that have possible uh, uh, lo location and also you don't want to have a perfect uh, alignment you want to tolerate uh, mismatch or gaps in your uh, in your map in your uh, look in your mapping because you want to identify variants if you only uh, tolerate only perfect match you want just will keep the what is what is exactly the same as the reference, and that you don't need it. In fact, so there's many uh, many um, algorithm and method to do that. We use uh, the Bureau Wheeler transform um, uh, approach, which is implemented in the BWA uh, aligner. But there's also many other uh, aligner you can use. So BWA is a really good aligner. It's one of the best aligner dedicated to DNA. But if you know, like Bota is one for uh, that is really used for RNA. So depending on what type of data, you will probably have to change the aligner. When you have, when you align your aligner, it's really really important to include a kind of tags for each library you have generated and each lane of sequencing uh, you have generated. The idea of, of that is to add identifier to your uh, to your experiment because sometimes you will merge several lane of sequencing together to generate a final. Uh, data set, and you want to be able to track back where your read come from for the different uh, experiment. If you have any issue, you can able to then to look if the issue is only um, specific to one experiment or to the whole biological sample. And also because you will see that there's many tools that we will use that need this information. When you do your alignment, you generate a, a set of files which is called uh, SAM or BAM, so it's uh, the, the data, the, 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 the data type we use to store alignment. So ta SAM is a text format, and BAM is a binary format. So almost nobody uses SAM because it's too big, 
the size of the BAM file could be between 10 and 500 gigabytes. So you can imagine if we uncompress that, it's really much uh, larger. So it's why nobody uses uh, SAM file almost. So for each alignment in your in your uh, in your BAM file, you will have uh, this uh, one line, one line, a big line, which will give this information. So we will have the same read name and in the fast queue, a flag. So it's a bitwise flag. So it's kind of way to encode how your mapping have gone. So we will see that in the in the in the practical. You've got the two positions. So chromosome and position on the chromosome of your reads, of the starting of your reads. The quality of your alignment, the quality is the same as the base quality, the FRED score. But it, instead of going on the error possibility of error of your basis, it's possibility of error on your mapping. So the same approach. A cigar string will tell you how your read is, is mapped. The position of the paired and read, if you have paired and reads. And then uh, you will have the intersize between the two reads, and then you have your sequence in uh, nucleotide and your sequence in base quality. And then you will have extra flag, which, which are uh, specific to each aligner. Uh, question. Yes? Is this the uncapped mapping only? Sorry? Is it only for uncapped mapping? What do you mean by uncapped mapping? It means that the read map to the present genome mm -hmm. could yes. secondly. No. So is it, is, it is it possible to one half, maybe one position, yeah. yeah, the read could be split into. Uh, in, I'm not sure. The, I mean, so the read could be. So the question is, is the alignment reporting only ungapped uh, mapping? No, the, the, the read could be split. In case the read is split, one part of the read will be uh, tagged as primary alignment, because for stat you don't want to count the two uh, part of your read as the same read. So one will be marked as a primary alignment, but the other will be uh, linked to the other. So you could have really like gap and distance, especially when you do RNA. You expect to have read that map from one exon to the other exon. So you need your read to be split into uh, the two, the two locations. So when you generate your uh, reads, uh, the next thing to do before doing variant calling is to refine your alignment. Because uh, alignment is really something tricky uh, aligner, any align, oh, none of the aligner is perfect. So when you choose an aligner, you you choose some constraint of what how you will uh, do the alignment. So you need to correct for this constraint to have the best the best alignment you can. So the first thing you do is to do indirect realignment. So why we do that is because most of the aligner tend to prefer having mismatch instead of having gap. So when you have indels, they tend to do not. Uh, uh, insert the indel in the alignment and to install instead several snip, fake snip around the indels. So what you want to do is to go over this possible indels and to realign uh, things that there's, possibly, there's a possibility of indels and to uh, realign the reads to be sure that you don't create this fake uh, snip. So usually you have this kind of pattern uh, before alignment, uh, after alignment you create the indel and all the fake snip uh, disappear. Also as I say, uh, you have a lot of, uh, you, you, in your data, you could face the, having some duplicates, so the same, several copies of the same original DNA fragment, and you want to count only one copy of your, of each original molecules. Because if you have, for example, a sequencing error at the beginning of your, uh, of your first step of your library, and you have several, several copies of these uh, molecules with an error, you will, it, you, it will appear for you as a SNP if you don't count that is just the same copy of the same fragment. What you want is to see biological fragment, biological variation in different original cop uh, DNA copy. So to do that, we, uh, we, we remove the, so the duplicates, and we keep only one read per uh, fragment. Also, uh, the, sequencer, uh, the sequencer usually tend to inflate the, data, the quality of the data. And especially, some of the quality is biased by a specific genomic context or position in the read. So what we need, we need to correct to have a more <coughs> homogeneous uh, distribution of the base quality. So we do a best recalibration. So when you do that, you have a set of really like um, high quality alignment file, and you are ready to do your variant calling. So a, one thing I want to add that, which is really, really important to do, is that each step of your analysis, you need to generate matrix. It's really important because it's where you will be able to see when you have something that goes wrong and to understand what goes wrong. 
So matrix at, the, at each step is really important. So as I say, we should collect the matrix at each step. And there's a lot of tools you can use to do that. So matrix at trimming, alignment, the depth of coverage, and that's a lot of metrics. So the next, the, next, the, the next step of the pattern will be present in module three. So in conclusion, uh, if you want to do NGS analysis, uh, it will require you to do a lot of uh, informatic skills to just launch a pipeline and run the analysis, and also a lot of mathematical skills to understand what you are doing, because it's usually good to understand what you are doing. Just don't click on the button and, and trust what uh, the software do. Um, really important, as I said previously, metrics, metrics, metrics. The more metrics you will have, the more um, um, the, the, the more uh, uh, confidence you will have in your data. Uh, important, when you generate alignment, alignment is not perfect, refine the quality of your alignment. And as I say, which is go with the mathematics, you need to have a good knowledge of what you are doing, how the data generate to understand what the artifact you can uh, face at the end of your analysis. And the last thing is uh, the more challenging, actually, for the doing NGS analysis at a large scale is not to do the analysis, but is more to have the sufficient amount of storage and the sufficient amount of resources to do the, the analysis. Thank you. Any question? Yeah? Is, the, is this a process that you intervene with at each step along the way? Or is this press a button, you know, you upload your FASCU files and you press a button and you wait some variable like the time so no. So the question is: Is it a process that you do it manually, or you do it like automatically in a, like a, a pipeline way? So no, for like a, this kind of standard analysis, at the center we have developed our own pipeline. So we uh, press the button, and we hope everything will be fine until the end, which is not which is not often often the case. There's always like. A co uh, like a cluster, the cluster can like powered off, or uh, um, uh, a file could be too large for what the setting we use in the pipeline. So sometimes we have to redo and go it manually. But we, in many cases, it goes all along the, the process, and we just need to like um, monitor how the process is going, monitor when the stat is coming out of the of the of the of the pipeline to see okay where are this step we saw we show the metrics the metrics looks good. Let's continue to run the pipeline. If we saw that the matrix is not good, we stop and try to understand what's happened to the to, to the data. But it's at the beginning we do it. We were doing it manually, but by the time we're now doing it since uh, uh, like five between five and ten years of of uh, experiment to do that kind of analysis, we have automated all the process. So if you go in the pipeline in the Pipeline I present on the on the on the beginning on the on the software. All this pipeline is automated. You can just like, not one click because you have to set up the pipeline, set up your file for your, but you just will need to set up and then launch the pipeline and the job will be display. Will all dependency of job will be taken into account and you just need to attend and to receive the email that your job is is finished. Yeah. How do you determine what are good quality metrics? Is that something you develop in house or is there like gold standard? So, uh, so there's no gold standard that have been published as okay. This is the standard metrics, but they're kind of standard. But it's really depend. Each time you have a new technology, so each time Illumina release a new version of their uh, chemistry, we need to reevaluate that and to see if our standard is still okay, and if there's no. The metrics we need to add on a threshold of quality we need to adjust. So it's why there's no gold standard because the technologies change so so, uh, so often that the standard will have to adjust to the, to each new change. But there's some kind of rule of thumb that we know based on experiment. For example, when we uh, sequence human, uh, we expect that has, due to the quality of the reference genome, we expect that the the percentage of reads that are aligned to the to the genomes is around 95% of the read. If you start to see lower level of uh, uh, read alignment, like 90, 80, you start to say, oh, probably there's all other type of DNA in my uh, experiment. You know, this, this, is, this, this is this kind of 
of uh, metrics, but there's no like really uh, gold standard that have been set in stone saying this is the metrics you need to uh, to have. It's more like kind of experiment. But for example, for the quality, for for when we look at base quality, uh, we use 30 as a standard. But if we want to do more or less stringent because we want to tolerate more, we can we can adjust uh, the thresholds. So for example, when you do DNA, you go around 30. But sometimes when you want to do assembly, you don't want to have so much variation, so much error. So you can pop up to 35 or more. So you need to adjust depending on what you are doing. Mm -hmm.